Good evening, everybody, and welcome to St. James's Church, Piccadilly. My name is Lucy Winkett. I'm the rector here. And from time to time, we hold debates on a variety of topics uh, in partnership with Just Share. Um, you can Google Just Share and find out more about them. They hold a lot of uh, events and debates both here at St. James's, uh, but most of their events are at St. Mary Le Beau on Cheapside, which is uh, just by St. Paul's Cathedral in the, in the City of London. So welcome to this uh, debate tonight, which is entitled Violence Against Women and Girls, Reason to Hope. We've got a very eminent panel of speakers here tonight, and the format will be that each of them will speak for about 10 minutes, uh, giving their own perspective on this topic of violence against women and girls. After that, we'll have a short panel discussion, and if one speaker would like to pick up something that another speaker has said, we'll do that. And then we've got plenty of time in the second half of the evening for there to be comments and questions and contributions from the floor. So we'll have a roving microphone at that point. So please uh, don't hesitate while the speakers are speaking to be thinking of questions or comments that you would like to make uh, from the floor. And then we will finish at half past seven. At half past seven, there is then uh, a drink available for you. There's some refreshments, which is at the front of the church on your left. So please do uh, stay for that if you can. Our first speaker tonight is Lisa Gormley. Lisa is a lawyer and until 2014 was a legal advisor at Amnesty International's International Secretariat, mostly specializing in women's rights in international law. During that time, she participated in the negotiation of the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, which was adopted in 2002. Since leaving Amnesty International, Lisa has been teaching the module on women's human rights law on the LLM program at Essex University. She is also a consultant for the International Commission of Jurists, published on International Women's Day, which was a uh, consultant, a practitioner's guide on women's access to justice for gender-based gender violence. And that was published on Women's Day on the 8th of March, 2016. So please, would you welcome to the podium, Lisa Gormley. Thank you, um, Reverend Lucy, for that kind introduction and, and for this invitation to this beautiful place. Um, it's a privilege to be here and I'm, I'm so glad to, I don't often speak in churches, in fact this is a, a first time for me, so usually I'm in NGOs or LSE or, uh, you know, with governments, uh, so this is a new thing for me, so thank you for this kind invitation. Um, so the, the title that we've been asked to discuss is Violence Against Women and Girls is a Reason to Hope, and I think yes. As a lawyer, as an international lawyer, I say yes, there is reason to hope. Um, probably you've heard of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I emphasize human rights. The first draft, or an original draft, that it was going to be the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Man, but then uh, there was a bit of intervention and different drafts and, uh, from, from women who took part in that negotiation. And they said, no, let's call it the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, and equality of women and men, boys and girls, was, was, in, was in that declaration from the start. And since then, in 1948, which is that period just post-war, there's, there's been a kind of, how do I put it, a, a weaving or perhaps a construction, a building, an intersection, a, a tapestry of legal uh, commitments by states. Um, all states in the world, all states in the world have to some extent or other signed up to it. So even states like China or uh, Iran, for example, all of them have a certain amount of human rights commitment in their laws. Um, and the principle of non-discrimination on the grounds of sex, like non-discrimination on the grounds of religion and race, is inherent to all those treaties. Um, and Violence against women, uh, wherever it takes place, whether in, by the state, either in prisons or during conflict, in communities, street harassment, 
violence in communities or in families, um, that violence against women and girls has been recognised as a form of discrimination. It's also been discriminated, uh, been uh, recognised as a form of torture. So uh, th there's th this intersection across all the treaties, the Convention Against Torture, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International uh, Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, all knitting together, all understanding discrimination um, and violence against women as something that is against human rights law. And what does that mean in practice? It means that states have to have laws, practices and policies to address violence against women, um, all forms of violence against women, so uh, FGM, forced marriage, um, rape in marriage, um, rape in the community in conflicts, um, violence against children, all those things are understood as violations of international human rights law. And what this means particularly, I think, for in relation to religious life and the rights of religious people is, is particularly to look at personal status laws. Um, so the laws governing marriage, divorce and child custody, often those are influenced by religious texts or religious beliefs and often they can be very discriminatory. So, for example, um, I was in Lebanon, uh, I've been in Lebanon various times over the years, talking to women there, and it, it's a diverse religious um, place. There are Christian sects, Muslim sects. Um, it, it's incredibly diverse, Orthodox, Catholic, you name it, it it's all there. Um, but they all have very similar personal status laws. And, and I met women there who were victims of domestic violence in their marriage, but they knew that if they tried to get a divorce or leave that marriage, then they would have to give up the rights to custody of their children, and they weren't willing to leave those children in a dangerous situation with a violent, with a violent parent. And so for that reason, they were, they were forced to stay in violent marriages because of the personal status law. So I think um, that's an issue for people of faith, um, to look at personal status laws, um, to think about what religions might mean uh, in terms of the freedom of action of women who are victims of violence. Um, and when I talk about women, I, I also particularly think about adolescent girls, because in lots of places in the world, once a girl hits puberty around 10 or 11, then she's seen as a grown woman. And uh, the responsibilities of being an adult are often put on girls in that situation. They're, they're forced into marriage. Um, they're, they're seen as adult women. And they're not, they're still children and they still deserve all the rights uh, inherent in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, um, I was asked to reflect on what, what it is that people of faith can do to, to look at this, this issue and to support women and, and girls in these situations. And I think making space within your religious and cultural communities for women's experiences, both good and bad, and allowing women absolute freedom of participation to create your religious cultures, uh, to participate in your religious cultures, and it's across religions as well. Um, there's, there's no one religion or other that is, uh, well, having looked at the, um, the reports of states all around the world, a lot of religions have this, this particular issue, particularly around personal status law. So perhaps it's an ecumenical matter for you to be raising in your communications with other religious organizations and other uh, traditions um, to promote that compassion, um, to promote that respect for each individual's human rights. So I shall leave it there for now. Um, I look forward to a debate. As I say, this is my first time in a church talking about these issues. So um, thank you for your attention and I look forward to having a discussion. Thank you so much. Our second speaker is Iman Abu Atta, OBE. Iman is the director of Tell Mama, which stands for Measuring Anti-Muslim Attacks Project in the UK. 
She's also the founder of two not-for-profit organizations established to facilitate the socio-economic and political development of the Arab region. One of these is Schemi, Social Change Through Education in the Middle East and North Africa. This, education, this organization works on education for women and families and is also working on stopping the trafficking of young females from Iraq to neighboring countries in the Middle East. Iman dedicates her time and efforts to building the capacity and skills of young people, women, civil society and political leaders across Europe in the Middle East to promote inclusive, participatory and cohesive societies. Please welcome Iman. Good evening. So I'm going to talk more from a personal experience, where I come from, and why I got involved in the work that I do. Uh, so I come from the Middle East. I come from Palestine. I'm Palestinian. Um, born and raised in a family which offered me a lot, gave me a lot, and upskilled me to be the woman I am today. And I'm thankful, very thankful to that. I grew up in a country that has got a lot of conflict. I grew up to understand what communities face. I grew up to live within the challenges of living in an occupied land. And I grew up really in a, in a place where human rights are violated. I grew up to see people getting killed and murdered on the streets from both sides. So a lot of things that actually made me the person that I am today. I was raised, I was born, raised and educated in Palestine, in Jerusalem. And I moved to the UK eight years ago, nine years ago. And one of the things that drove me to start the work around Middle East, and around women, and around issues that women tend to have in the Middle East was really the opportunities that the UK opened for me, and also how I can be able to empower women back home. So while doing research, I found out that there's a lot that's taking place in conflict areas where we talk around sexual violence, we talk around um, violence against women all the time. In every space, in every society, in every country, it exists. It's not only one society that has this. But I thought of looking at really at conflict areas, and specifically in the Middle East, one of the countries that I researched at the time was Iraq. And I looked at what happened um, in terms of women and the, the status of women and the issues that women suffered during the Iraq war. And I saw that there's a lot that's taking place in terms of sexual exploitation, in terms of trafficking, that no one has highlighted, no one has talked about. And I thought that's a topic that is worth the research, that's a topic that it's worth to be highlighted. And um, we started really to put research together to see what's happening there and what's happening really to women, to young girls, and what can be done to help them and support them. So the research looked on Middle Eastern cultures, as well as other cultures, but at methods of trafficking, sexual exploitation, and what are the reasons and the, the leads behind really women being trafficked. Religion was one element, but it was not the only element. We're talking about conflict areas, we're talking about wars, we're talking about people sometimes looking for another sort of income, like families actually saying, well, I can marry off my daughter and I know she'll be okay, um, they'll get a certain amount of money, but actually their daughter is being trafficked out of the country. She is leaving the country with her husband, which is the legal companion under, under the law to leave the country, but eventually she's being trafficked in other places like Syria or Jordan. So we looked more in depth into that, and we looked at this is a trend that's happening worldwide, but the focus that I wanted to focus on is really what can I do in the Middle East to be able to, be able to shed a light on this, be able to support organizations that are working on this, be able to work with, with different organizations that come from different religious backgrounds to offer shelters for these women who have been trafficked and these young girls who have been trafficked. And that's a very important thing to look at, that actually all of the religions, and I try not to even address within the work that I do, the religious element, but look at it from different communities, they all come together to actually be able to provide that shelter and protection for the women. And what really happens to these women along the, the, these journeys? What happens to these young girls along these journeys? Um, one, the stereotype that they end up um, being tabooed for. The element of actually a woman being married and then getting divorced or leaving her husband. The element of a woman going back to her family to be able to talk to them about what's going 
uh, on with her, which never happens in so many families, not only in the Middle East. So a lot of the things and dynamics um, that actually I've seen and, and we've researched, I thought of, okay, great, I'm going to shed the light on this and start challenging some of the um, stereotypes and some of the taboos that actually societies that I come from actually stand for and do not speak out against. And when we launched our report here in the UK, and I remember launching it within, the initial report was within um, a, con a confined confidential uh, setting within some of the communities in the Middle East, I had so many raised eyebrows that I'm actually talking about something that does not exist, that it's, I'm actually making it up, that it's something that does not happen. And that was, even for me, a further challenge and a further step to actually go further in depth into my research and see really what's happening to these women and what, what is happening when they've been trafficked into Syria, into Lebanon, in Jordan, and what happens nowadays with the, with the Syria crisis and refugee crisis that we have and the Syria war that's taking place. These women are now in Syria. What happened to them in Syria? Where are they today? What is happening, why, what is happening to the children that they gave birth to? There's a whole scenario that when you look at uh, women and violence, you have to look at. It's not only one woman who's impacted. It's not only one girl who's impacted. We're talking about a whole society that is impacted. We're talking about a whole community that is impacted. We're talking about each one of us being impacted. You being here today, you are here to listen to us. You are here to actually learn more about what we have to say. It's because you believe in nonviolence against women, or at, I'd assume so. It's because you want to know what can be done and it's your voices, along, along as well other voices that are the ones and the drive to the change that we're looking for. We talked about the legal status, we talked about the laws, we talked about governments, we talked about civil society. But unless we do something about it, that drive for the laws to be in place in governments, that drive for the change for us to see within the societies is not going to happen. You can draft as much as you want laws, and I've seen that in so many countries. But unless there's someone that demands for these laws to be actually impacted on the ground and delivered on the ground, they're not going to happen. Unless you know that it is your right to actually ask for that law to be in place, it's not going to happen. So there's a lot that falls on us as individuals to actually act on for us to be able to push forward the issues and concerns that we have around violence against women. And then when we talk about discrimination, and I know my, my, my colleague previously talked about discrimination, then yes, when you are discriminating a woman because she's a woman, and you feel that you have more power to act a certain violence on that woman, you are discriminating against that woman. In the same manner that if you see a woman walking down the street, and you feel, oh, that woman is oppressed because she is a female, and I can't have a go at her, that's already as well a sense of discrimination. That's where sexism is. That's what, that's what happens on a day-to-day -day basis within the female environment that we live at. We all of us tend to get a comment which is a bit sexist. That's, that's, again, another part of education that we need to pick up on and really educate the society that we are at. And that holds as well responsible to what is on us. On us as females, but as well on the males that are here in the audience, as well on you as males and what can be done to challenge this. And unless we stand up, whether it's us from our end as females or you from your, your end as, as females in the audience or males, to actually for any discrimination that we see, whether it's violence against women or any kind of discrimination, whatever we see it, we're not going to change anyone's behavior. We're not going to be ab able to educate the younger generation that's coming up that we do not tolerate this in our society or societies. So there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of um, acting on violence against women and discrimination. And then when you talk to, to women here in the UK, whether they come from Middle Eastern background or none, generally women, and you start really um, detangling some of the stuff that they go through, there's always an element of violence that women tend to feel. I've, I've been working now in the UK for eight years. I've been working in the hate crime field for five years. And there's not only one single case that I worked on in the hate crime field where I spoke to women that suffered a certain type of hate crime that did not feel that there was an element of violence in a language that they've heard. Not one. That's a lot. If, if, if we as females, if you as mothers, we're the ones that are bringing the next generation, we're the ones that are actually giving birth to the men that are growing up, if we're not able to stand and fight for that element of violence and sexism that we're going through, then there's a lot that needs to be done. 
So I'll leave you with two things. One, education. What can be done around education on a day-to-day -day basis with youngsters today, within our families, within our wider society to address this? And two, what role can each one of us play in addressing, in addressing issues around violence against women, whether it's here in the UK or whether it's internationally? Because whatever happens in the UK impacts the world and vice versa. Today we live in a world where everything tends to pass on the information within seconds on social media. Today we see that whatever happens on social media is taken to the offline, to the street level world and vice versa. So what do we do as individuals to challenge this? Thank you. Our third speaker is Dr. Elaine Storkey, a philosopher, sociologist and theologian who's held university posts at King's College London, Stirling, Oxford, Calvin College in the United States and the Open University. Elaine is a broadcaster and writer and has been involved with the BBC for 30 years. Her writing includes eight books and hundreds of journal articles. She's a fellow of Aberystwyth University, a senior member of Newnham College, Cambridge, and former director of the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. Her presidency of Tear Fund in aid and development spans 17 years and influenced her most recent book, Scars Across Humanity, Understanding and Overcoming Violence Against Women. And you'll be able to buy Elaine's book if you would like to after this uh, debate, again at the front of the church here on the left. So please do welcome Elaine Storkey. I think I can work it. It's a huge privilege to be here tonight with you. Um, the big issue of violence against women I encountered many, many years ago here in the UK in terms of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, rape, incest, and so on. But it really wasn't until I became president of Tear Fund and did a lot of global traveling that I began to see the global nature of violence against women and realized it is indeed a global pandemic. And the thing that struck me most of all was the way that violence was often institutionalized in cultural patterns in different societies. And so the question that we've got tonight is their hope, can we actually hope to eradicate violence, has to be answered in two ways. First of all, I think the answer is yes, most certainly, but we do have to know what we're up against. And secondly, we have to have some understanding of why it happens. Why is there violence against women? Why are women targeted for these kinds of practices that I'm just going to outline for you? I'm just given to give a very quick presentation of the kinds of violence to, against women that I've encountered whilst um, I've been president, but also in general. And all of these are in the book. Each book chapter has a chapter on one of these forms of violence. And violence, if you ask a question where in an average global, <clears throat> this mythical idea of a global woman's life cycle, where does violence occur? The answer is all the way through. And it really starts in the womb. And it starts with selective abortion, <coughs> and particularly, of course, in India. Many campaigners in India, many feminists, but also doctors, um, even politicians, have got a massive campaign to eradicate the uh, fetal um, kind of killing, killing of girl babies in the womb, the selective abortion that goes on there. And those are very conservative figures. Now it's argued that the figure is much higher than that. And the abortion clinics advertise, spend 5,000 rupees now, so I'll save 50,000 rupees later. Why are they advertising that? Um, and what does the government do? Well, the government passes laws but doesn't implement them. And so instead it puts up posters like this encouraging women to want girl babies and to look after them. So the big question at the end of all of these is why? Why is there selective abortion? And the answers are not just so simple. The answers are there in cultural uh, practices, they're economic, they're very closely tied up with the dowry and the practice of the dowry, with the patrilocal nature of the family, with the fact that boy, boy, boy babies are valued so much more than girl babies and so on. And all of these things there, the failure to implement the law, philosophical, theological issues all play into them. 
And when we look at the next uh, area of violence against women that I've chosen, which is FGM, <laughs> and that happens before puberty, sometimes in very small children, sometimes after puberty, sometimes in adult women. And what is it? <coughs> Well, it's um, one of four different kinds. I'm not going to, I haven't got time to go into each of these kinds, but the most brutal form of FGM, sometimes called the pharaonic um, kind or the Sudanese kind, is where most of the uh, genitalia of a woman is cut away, where the clitoris, but also the labia, and right into the vagina is cut, and then she is stitched up um, so that she will never have intercourse until her wedding night, leaving only a tiny hole for menstrual blood and urine to pass through. And the wedding night, which is supposed to be the most wonderful night of the, her, her life, is billed that way, and the women I've talked to say it's the most horrendous night of their life, because the bridegroom has the enormous privilege of cutting the bride open in order to have sex with his bride. I've also talked to men who perform this, and frankly, they don't enjoy it. It's not a great feat for them to actually have to cut open the wife and then endure her screaming as they have sex because it's so painful and agonizing. So the whole area of FGM is something again, um, and it's, of course, uh, we have it in our own country. This is an, a report issued suggesting that around 140,000 women in England and Wales are living with the consequences of FGM. About 10,000 girls this year are at risk of being sent back or being cut, even in our own country. And these some things, uh, how is it happening? It's often happening with very unhygienic, unsterile implements and so on. And again, we come to the question, why? Why? <clears throat> because there are no known health benefits. It's barbaric, it's brutal, it's actually uh, seriously <coughs> mutilating a girl's body. And again, we have all the same sorts of answers. It's cultural, it's social, it's about the rites of passage. Women make a habit of uh, earning money from the process because they're the ones who generally are doing it. Um, it's views of bodily. It's suggesting that women have no right to enjoy sexual intercourse, so we'll make sure that their sexuality is controlled, etc., etc. and the ownership of women's sexuality. The third one I want to look at is the whole area of child brides. I wasn't going to put this in the book initially, but it was because a friend of mine in Zimbabwe had spent a lifetime campaigning against child brides, and she says, you have to include this, it's vital. Every three seconds, a girl under the age of 18 is married somewhere across the world, mostly without consent, usually to a very much older man. And so this incredible um, era of child marriage, these are some pictures of children who are married under age, and of course, they have no right to um, safe sex, they have no <clears throat> means of discussing this, and these are some of the things that they have to struggle with, and of course, at high risk of violence from their partner and nowhere to go. And again, the big question, why? Well, again, it's cultural, but it's also economic. Much of it happens because of poverty, because families cannot bring up daughters, so they're exchanged and so on. But it's also, there's lots and lots of myths about the, the uh, the sanctity of, of uh, the man once he becomes uh, married to a child bride and so on. And similarly with honor killings, the next one, um, the brutal attack on women but also men who fall out of line with the family mores, they can be stoned to death. Um, I have friends who have changed their identity because they're afraid that if their families know where they are now and can trace them, they too will be in risk of losing their lives. Um, some of the most horrendous practices where even the violator is the hero very often of the community because he has resisted westernization or resisted um, the, the, the girl being prey to values that are not their own. <coughs> Why again? Um, familial values, cultural values, psychological control, rejection of political, what they see as political intrusion into their way of life and they backed up with theological and philosophical things. And so it goes on. Intimate partner violence <clears throat> is something that we really have on our own doorstep here in the UK. It's horrendous, it's massive. Um, 603 million women <clears throat> live in cultures where <clears throat> domestic violence isn't a crime, but actually even in our own culture, we have one of the highest rates of intimate partner violence in Europe. And we do very little about it. Look at the crime figures that I'm putting up there. 
um, something phenomenal in our own country, in our own communities. Very often in our own families this is going on. That's an acid attack, but this is far more common in terms of understanding it. Very often it's only when the violence is then enacted on, uh, on the children that the wife feels she really has to get out of this marriage. And there's a lot that we need to know about why people stay in partnerships where they're violated. I want you to look at the faces of these women and ask who are they? And they are actually women who last year, in January and February, were murdered by their partners. Um, and this is the figures again that we see. Up to two women are killed each week by a current partner in intimate partner violence. That's a massive death rate. Um, what causes it? Well, it can be any of these things, but it can simply be a desire to control, to punish, to be in charge of that person. Um, again, why? Well, it's about male entitlement. The male has the right to do this and feels he has the right to enact violence, abuse of power, lack of legal protection, collusion sometimes by authorities in some cultures. And again, views of women and sometimes distorted religious values, distorted teaching on theology and so on. And it's the same again, over and over again, whichever area we look at, whether we're looking at trafficking and prostitution as we are here, and just looking at the way in which, if you've got a map, a pie, a pie chart, look at the way in which predominantly it's women and girls who are trafficked for sex and sexual labor and sexual assault and so on. And the, the, the level of this um, is so high. And uh, again, it's par partly economic, partly social, but it's to do with international criminal networks and the lack of legal enforcement. And these are very well-trodden paths. So in asking, is there hope, we have to recognize that it's going on in all of these areas. It's going on in rape, as we see here. This is a student um, protest in Leeds University about the level of rape that's going on on university campuses. This is another one where the, the whole idea of rape culture is somehow endemic in the, in the culture that we live in. Rape jokes, jokes about women's sexuality jokes about harming women are accepted. And this one here, I never understand why it's more shameful to be raped than to be a rapist. And this is a stigma that many women feel, which is why they don't go to the authorities. Why does it happen? Again, male entitlement, power abuse, rape culture. The, the idea that women are there as commodities to be raped, punishment, hatred of women. We've heard that already, and I think that's so important. And again, a lack of legal protection. It's all of this is discriminatory wherever we look. And then the final category I look at in my book is sexual violence in war. And I'm very glad that we've already had that mentioned tonight. Sexual conflict, um, violence, conflict always produces sexual uh, problems for women because women often become scapegoated. They're the ones that the vengeance is turned on. And of course, many, many times in these pictures, <coughs> women are raped in order to make sure that the progeny they have are the children of the enemy, the ones who are attacking that. And it's to humiliate the men folk and so on. All of these reasons. These are taken uh, in some of Tierfund's partners who are working against the rape culture and actually helping women to survive these areas. Why? It's the brutality of war. Wherever you get war, wherever you get this brutality, you will get women, as scapegoats, humiliated, genocide, inflicting HIV AIDS quite deliberately. And you've got it in European wars everywhere. It doesn't have to be in far-flung countries away from us. And the morale boosting of the militia, the reason that uh, the Japanese uh, made use of uh, Filipino and Korean women in the, before the last war and during the last war was to boost the morale of the Japanese soldiers so that they would be better fighters. So that's what we're up against. <laughs> and we have to recognize that before we, um, that's my book, sorry before we can actually address whether or not we can, there is hope. And I think uh, when we recognize there is hope, we can look at it, how do we do this? And, and some of the issues that we've already been raised, I would want to concur with. Uh, better legislation, more, um, more monitoring, more careful uh, adjudication of what's going on. But faith groups, I want to just finish with now. Faith groups connect with millions of people across the globe. Out of the 7 billion people currently on our planet, something like 5.8 billion associate with a faith group in some way or another. And many of them associate very closely in a faith group. First of all, these faith groups have got to get their theology right. 
Christianity has, Islam has, and all of the other faith groups where these are, are working issues. And we have theologians at the moment across the world working, doing better theological training and partial work and so on. And then you, <clears throat> you have to act. This is in the Congo. <coughs> this is the Mother's Union in Goma, which is a Christian organization mobilizing communities to protect schoolgirls against rape. A really feisty bunch of women. And uh, this is some of the things that they're doing. Um, no to uh, violence against women and so on. And uh, lots and lots of other groups. And in our own country, Christian groups have sprung up all over the place, here looking at trafficking and prostitution, and some of them on uh, getting young women together in groups all over the country, small groups working with street women and seeing if they can bring help and help into their lives. And uh, first man standing, I'm a member, an ambassador for Restored, and Restored has this wonderful organization uh, which is actually looking at survivors, helping survivors of intimate partner abuse and other forms of abuse to get their self-respect back and move into a redemptive area. And this is in Zimbabwe and uh, another area in Zimbabwe. Um, producing a contextualized first man standing booklet to help men who themselves um, either are abusive or want to say, not in my name. This abuse cannot go on in my name. I want to be standing there against this and in Kenya too. Uh, and opening people's eyes through the training process. Faith groups can help in one other way too. And that is, they can answer the question, why for us? And Christianity answers the question why by pointing not to our creation, created by God for love and to love one another, but to our sinful way in which we actually violate that, that love in our lives, the way that we do exploit one another, the way that we take advantage of one another, the way that we hate one another, and we allow hatred into our lives. And sin, um, violence against women is one form of sin writ large, but sin is a very optimistic concept because it means that we don't have to stay there. We can move on to redemption, and we can see something new and something hopeful. And I think when we all faith groups work together with humanitarian groups right across the globe, we will see something different, and I believe we're already beginning to see it in embryo. Thanks for listening. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have a chance for uh, questions and comments from the audience, so do please uh, think of those. We've got a microphone that will come around shortly, but perhaps I can just ask um, our three speakers. We've heard, uh, we heard about the legal situation. We heard a particular um, investigation of, uh, from Iman about, from her Palestinian context about Arab culture and challenging taboos. And then from Elaine, we heard that this is a global pandemic, in your words, Elaine. The, there was one thing that occurred to me, really, which is to try and put those two things together, the power of law, power of legislation, but also, is it fair to say that just as powerful as legislation are the myths and the stories that we tell ourselves about each other, women tell ourselves about each other, as well as men tell about us? I wondered if you could comment on what, what relative power you think those two aspects of our culture have and how they can work together, which has to change first? Perhaps Elaine, would you like to start? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Am I here? Am I here? Yes, you're fine. Yeah. I, think, I think the stories, the attitudes that we have, the stories that we believe, um, even the cattiness and bitchiness that women can actually exam you know, exemplify in their relationships with each other are incredibly unhelpful. Um, and actually don't, uh, don't give men any encouragement um, to behave properly as well. So I think one of the first things we can do is have good relationships with each other, speak well of each other, uh, look out for each other, and recognize that we are human beings, all of us, in need of love, and love is our birthright, that's what we're made for. Um, and therefore, not to actually hold up um, unrealistic standards of, of beauty, of uh, youth, or all of the things that our culture idolizes with each other, and judge one another in that way. So leaving women the freedom to be themselves, who they are, um, and knowing that freedom and endorsing that freedom. And I think once we, we do that for each other as women, um, rather than always judging and always pulling people back into line, always dragging people down, that, that's a good place to start. Thank you. Iman, would you comment on that as well? Yeah, just pull it It's hard to follow now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think, well, treating people the way we want to be treated, I think this is the way for us to interact with each other. But when we look at laws and regulations and we look at um, communities, let's also not forget the cultural laws that are around us that mm. sometimes are more even powerful than the laws that we have in place in terms of legislation. So there's a lot that we have to look at when we're looking at the power and how can we work around women's issues. But if we are look to, talking about a woman to a woman thing or a man to a woman thing or a woman to a man thing, really the one thing to think of is whether we're speaking about each other or speaking to each other is to really think that I might be in that person's shoe, shoes and I might as well treat that person in the same manner that I want to be treated. Would I, would I actually be, um, be okay to hear these words? Would I be okay if I act in that way? And then to challenge some of the cultural issues and concerns that come up, whether it's families or whether it's the cultural baggage that some countries have or some countries even bring or some communities bring even with them, whether it's to the UK or to other places in the world. What kind of example could you give? So that? even when you're looking about issues, I'm going to pick even the simplest example, forget about even still going into the violence thing. I'm talking about divorce, separation. Sometimes in some communities and in some cultures, the whole element of separation is something that, whoa, if you do it, that's the end of the world. Um, what's going to happen to the family? What's going to happen to the children, if there are children? But what's going to happen to the woman? Is anyone going to really want that woman again? Yes. Women are people that are wanted. A woman has the right to decide whether she wants to be wanted or not. Um, so there's a lot that we have to look at when, when we judge as well anyone or any community. We have to really take our assumptions lightly when we look at other communities and other cultures. Because we might sometimes think that we know everything, mm. and we don't. We don't know what families go through. We don't know what cultural um, background they come from. We don't know what really is happening within that society. So that there's a lot of thinking as well that we have to do when we're, before we judge anyone. And always, always, always really take our assumptions lightly. Mm. Lisa, can I ask you, you were probably mm. the most optimistic in tone <laughs> of us, uh, in the sense that you said that, you know, these, since the Declaration mm. of Human Rights, there are laws, yes. whether they're implemented is a whole other thing, but mm. could you just comment on the relationship between cultural laws mm. and legislation? Um, yes, uh, I, so when I talk about law, it's not just about um, criminal law, um, it's about international human rights law, mm. and that requires states to have a legal framework to address violence against women, but also a policy framework. Um, and part of the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women has an article, article number five, which asks states to work to transform stereotypes that, that support discrimination against women. And you may say, okay, well, that's not, you know, does that have much effect? But Really, it does. If a state takes that responsibility seriously and say, for example, make sure that the education of all children promotes uh, equality and non-discrimination, promotes non-violent conflict re resolution between kids and as they get older, promotes comprehensive sexuality education, which is based on science um, and promotes uh, relationships that are based on not just consent but on enthusiastic agreement. Uh, if, if, if young people uh, and adults uh, want to um, engage in sexual relationships, this has to be done f absolutely freely with enthusiasm. Not, not situations like the, you know, the, the, the rape cases that we read about, um, the, the black cab rapist or the, the rape of, um, the, of a woman in Northern Ireland by the rugby team. You know, it's, states have a lot that they can do. Um, and we can demand more from our states and more from our media particularly because I think rape victims particularly find it very hard to come forward because of the, the stigma and the stereotyping and we can we can demand changes of it in the media and we can demand changes in the state so for example um, we've all talked really compellingly I think about intimate partner violence but you know a, a large proportion of women at least 30 percent of women here in the UK who want to go to a refuge because they, they're, they're not safe, they're being beaten by their partner, and they get turned away either because there's no funding anymore, so there's not sufficient space in the refuge, and then some women who are here, who are asylum seekers, who have 
um, and it's a, it's a, a, a rule of um, immigration law that some migrant women have no recourse to public funds. So basically, if they can't get housing benefit, they can't go to a refuge. Mm -hmm. And and y y we can ask our our government, our parliamentarians, our representatives to change that, to to, to invest in women, to invest in women's safety. In fact, yeah. could yes. I mention that what's very really interesting, um, and this is why I'm also optimistic, is that almost single-handed, a, a young woman got together a whole group to try to force the government's hand on the whole Istanbul Convention, Istanbul Convention, which says it has zero tolerance mm -hmm. to violence against women. And for decades, we have been trying to get our government in the UK to ratify this convention. We've signed it, but we, it wasn't ratified. And they've always said the same thing for the last decade. Uh, oh, we have very robust laws. We don't need this convention to be ratified here. Ratifying a convention means you have to put your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they have to then fund the refuges and fund uh, women's aid when women are being violated and so on. Um, a young woman I know personally got together an interfaith group um, and started um, campaigning for the uh, ratification of the Istanbul Convention, eventually found a private member in the House of Commons. Uh, the member came at the top of the ballot. She brought this forward. It went through three readings, one of reading of which was just before Christmas, uh, when everybody had gone home. But in fact, the, the MPs stayed and have seen it through. So now our government is obliged, because it's passed its third reading, to bring forward measures to ratify the Istanbul Convention. That's wonderful. That's democracy. Um, and then that's law, and it makes it work. And laws do work. I, I'm really keen on laws. And the UN protocols are fantastic. If you look at the legal changes in the Gulf and in North Africa, especially on the whole issue of child rape, that a girl no longer has to marry her rapist mm -hmm. if this is what the family wants. She can say, no, I'm not going to marry the rapist. And he, before, he could get scot-free, not face any punitive action from the law if he married the woman, the girl that he had raped. What kind of marriage is that going to be? And now that actually has been repealed. So laws are all effective, but they do have to be implemented. Thank you. We'll go to, uh, go to our gathered audience here. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Uh, so yes, Simon, just over, yes, you in the middle there. Yes, Simon, mm -hmm. if you come forward, that's it, just there. Yeah, that lady there, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, you. <laughs> We make sure the uh, make sure the microphone's working. Is it working? No. <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> um, my question's for Elaine. I was hoping you could elaborate because I'm not sure if I misunderstood what you said you thought the most important course of action for women to take is. From my understanding of what you said, it was that women need to be less bitchy to one another, speak more kindly of one another. Um, but I don't personally feel that us trying to lead by example to other men is going to change anything. Um, I, do you not think that there needs to be sort of a more direct and um, assertive course of action than just us showing kindness to one another. Elaine, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually hear that. Did you hear so was, was it, um, you just wanted to check, was it the case that you said the first thing that women should do is to not be bitchy to one another and oh, to right. speak highly of one another? And the question is that you don't believe that that's uh, effective and you would think that isn't there something more assertive that women should be doing oh, yeah, just rather yes. than being kind to each other? <laughs> that, that was almost only an aside. I mean, that's a marginal thing. But I think it's something that we can do which will improve the situation. No, the real issue is to um, explain to men and explain it in no uncertain terms that they do not have entitlement um, to control over women's bodies, over women's sexuality, over women's health or anything, um, and that actually they're not the bosses. And so I think we have to do this both in terms of, um, of the law, of education particularly, it's got to go right through the school system and the university system, but also in our cultural groups. Um, and I think men, when men take a, a hand in this, when they also take a lead, it is very effective. Uh, a man rebuking another man 
who is saying something derogatory about women is far more effective than a woman trying to do it herself. Um, just okay. because it's way up. Thank you. Sorry, we, I do want to get through some of we. There was somebody else up here at the front. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, no, sorry. You, yeah. And then I'll come to you at the front. We'll take you two together. Okay. I, thank you. Um, this is also a question for Elaine. Hello. Um, <laughs> okay. I, um, I, I teach um, um, a course in kind of biblical gender studies or Radcliffe College, and one of my hated questions that I get every single year yeah, is, is the, basically the fact that um, a lot of students who still believe in male headship in Christian marriage uh, come to me and say, but Kirsty, you've misunderstood it. If your husband loved you like Christ loves the church, you would love to submit to that. Instead of killing them, what can I tell them? Well, yeah, I mean, headship in Christian theology, yes, yes. there you go. <laughs> Okay. The, the, um, for those who are not terribly interested in this, let me just give you a quick biblical background. Um, it's really from the letter of St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul uses this word, Greek word, kephali, which means this. Um, and what does head mean? It literally means a thing on the top of your neck. Uh, but somehow or another, we've turned it into a whole theological principle. We've, we've found a ship from somewhere, I don't know where, and tagged it along to the end of the head, and then made this into um, a, a symbol of authority that men have over women in marriage. Uh, I think you need to read the text much more carefully, and, and people are now reading the text much more carefully than before, and trying to get your head into what Paul is talking about, or what St. Paul is talking about when he's talking about marriage. In fact, if you read that passage, and it's in Ephesians chapter 5, if I remember rightly, um, he spends far more time telling men how they should love their wives than he does on this mythical concept of headship. He does say that men are the head of the women, but that um, you have to understand that in the context that he's saying it. So what does it mean in the context there? It means that men have to love their wives as Christ loved the church. But how did Christ love the church? Well, he went to the cross for the church. He died for the church. He got on the, on the dirty ground and washed his disciples' feet, groveling around. You know, he gave himself up for the church. If men are called to do this for their wives, it's a fairly tall order, and I'm not seeing an awful lot of it around. And it certainly is nothing to do with violating your wife and bossing her around. So even if you do believe in headship, let's get the headship right, what the implications are, rather than distort it in the way. But I think actually it means something very different, but there isn't time to go into it all. That's a whole other evening. Thank you. Yes, right at the front here. Um, Elaine, but I'm, I'm interested from, from all of you. Um, you mentioned um, male hatred of women and um, male entitlement. Those two um, aspects I have both experienced as a woman, but also read a great deal about um, some attitudes of uh, perpetrators of violence towards women in general. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as you've mentioned, there's many factors behind this, but it is, it is something we live with on a daily basis. Now, it's something we live with on a daily basis that I think is largely invisible to a, a large proportion of men. So my husband and my uh, father are both lovely, gorgeous men. And when I try and talk to them about it, they get this glazed, wary look. And I am really interested to know, uh, my daughter is five, what would you advise that needs to happen in each of the areas of your experience and expertise to tackle the issue that a large proportion of men don't get it and don't know that it's out there? I'm sure the panel members can help. Yes, indeed, too. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Why don't you my, go first? My immediate yeah. response would be, uh, it does start in the home, and I think the way in which we, I have three sons, all of whom call themselves feminists, um, and have no sense of male entitlement, and if they have, we kind of remind them very, very quickly. I mean, it does come from the culture that this isn't the case. Um, join first man, encourage young men to join First Man Standing, which is this Christian organization that learns how to be um, non-assertive and non-entitled men, and, uh, and in a sense, uh, learns a bit more about gender equality. How would you react if most men don't get it? Um, really stand up for what you believe in um, and challenge it. I think it, nothing comes easy. Nothing in life has come easy. Even, even if you're talking here about the feminist movement in the UK, it has not come easy. Uh, and you have to challenge it and you have to stand up to what, for what you believe in. I understand what you say about maybe you, you get sometimes the looks, but it's about really as well interacting with, with the males around you and showing them what you can do 
and that you can do everything equally as they can do it. So challenging it and standing up for it, that's it. Okay, we'll go to another question. There was somebody at the back there. Yes, or oh, halfway down, sorry. Yeah. Thank you all. I find it's really interesting. My question is starting for Iman, but obviously all of you as well. Um, I'm particularly interested in your suggestion that we as individuals can challenge, change things at a global level. But I'm just wondering how, because a lot of the focus on our personal relationships, how we relate to the, the men in our own lives and so on, but there's, it's quite difficult to see how we can, you know, or, you know, I'd really like some thoughts on how we can change things that are happening not in our own communities, but in other communities and in other parts of the world that, okay, we can all sign mass petitions and things like that, but how can we move the sort of changes in attitude and approach at an individual level into something that translates to a more global level? Imam, can I ask you to yeah, address that? And perhaps, you know, cross-cultural as well. Yeah. Uh, challenges, challenges. Are there some accepted, uh, you know, norms underneath all of that that you could kind of uh, appeal to, I guess, whatever the culture? So speaking up about it, I know like sometimes we don't talk about our personal lives and that's each one's personal life is up to them. And as you said, it might be not things that you're going through within your own personal life. But speaking about such topics with other communities, understanding the sensitivities and how to speak about this, um, because it's not something that you can come up with within another community and just talk about it the way we're doing it here. Mm. Okay, you cannot do that. So it's understanding sometimes the sensitivities that other cultures come from, other societies come from, and how we can talk about these things. And maybe building that trust and understanding between you and other communities. You start with that, building the trust between you and other communities for you to be able those discussions to come up and for someone to actually feel, oh my God, I do have a problem and I can come and speak to that person about it. And that's one. Two, as an individual, we can speak up against so many things and we can speak very loud about so many things. Whether it's the power of writing, whether it's the power of attending other events and speaking about this, whether it's really going and checking what's happening in our local areas or in our local communities about other events where we can tap in, talk to people, learn, learn more about it. And for us as well as individuals, it's as well educating the next generation. I mean, we all have, most probably, majority of us would have um, access to schools through our family members uh, or through contacts that we have. I did touch on the education at the beginning. Mm. So even sometimes even going and giving a talk about these things in schools, um, I know sometimes it takes a lot of courage to go and do that, but even tapping into some of the organizations, I mean, so many organizations were, men were mentioned in terms of names, but even maybe telling them, okay, maybe you should go into these areas and talk about this topic, um, understanding really what's happening in these communities. I mean, there's a lot that us we can do today, whether it's speaking up, whether social media, we all use social media. Uh, we all have access to social media. And there's so much around violence against women that's happening across the world. So mm -hmm. we talk about globally, our messages on social media, standing up to really any injustice that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot that really we can take part in. And, and believe it or not, really, when you take the first step, it opens up a lot of opportunities. And it's about really taking mm -hmm. that first step and the courage to take that step. We are running slightly over, but we started late, so I will uh, take that. Uh, so, yes, at the front here, and then at the back, and that will be the end, the last comment. Thank you all very much. Um, about 20 years ago, the, there was an exhibition of art by Iraqi women at the Diorama Art Centre, and also a lot of workshops on the arts in the Arab world, led by people from all over. And um, those of us in the, working in the building were, were uh, allowed to come along. And uh, what I heard again and again, exiles from Saddam's Iraq, saying they did not want the Americans and allies to come in. And this was actually the week before it happened. It must have, I can't remember the date, 205 or 6 or something. So what, what I, I think all three of you have said that, well, briefly, that um, war will exacerbate the mm. violence. Uh, you know, I just wondered whether you think this 
this was actually the prime concern um, when they um, gave this opinion um, against more, more countries coming in militarily. Iman, could you comment on that? Uh, gosh. I mean, the, the ones that pay the price of war and conflict are usually women and children in every conflict across the world. And despite the fact that there has been, the conflict has been ongoing for years in different places and across the world, I think lessons learned from what happens in these conflict areas or in these conflict zones are not learned, really. Because women still end up to pay a price and children still end up to pay a price. And when you're talking about people being displaced from their countries, when you're talking about uh, people being um, being raped when, when they're invaded, when you're talking about so many elements that women are used as a weapon in the war they are, um, there's a lot that is not put in place, whether we, with all my respect to um, the UN Rights Human Convention, with all my respect to international law, there's a lot that has not been taken into account in and lessons learned from other areas for it to be put in place for the new conflicts that we're having in place. And, and that's where, again, our role is important. Civil society roles are important. Uh, religious leaders, our mentioned um, roles, is important. Because we need to learn from the mistakes that have happened. We, we need to learn how we can challenge what has happened. And when we know about conflict areas, I mean, the one thing, really, honestly, when, when the whole Syria crisis started, the one thing that I thought of is really the women that were displaced from Iraq into Syria, what's going to happen to them? Because that's most probably what I work on. I mean, I'm sure others would do that. And again, it's about really trying to put in place measures that is able to help communities or bring more awareness, even awareness about the topics that conflict will impact. Thank you. We'll take one last uh, comment for the back there. Um, I have a comment rather than a question, which is in connection to the involvement of men. There's an, organi uh, there's an international group of organizations called the Men Engage Alliance, which has organizations mm. from all over the world who are working with boys at different age groups. So there's, in, in America, there's uh, an organization called Pramundo that works with fathers. In India, my own organization works with adolescent boys. There are organizations in Africa that works in schools. So all of these organizations are willing to share their resources in terms of the materials on how to work. Uh, what they need is support, investment, and sort of sharing of the materials that already exist rather than reinventing what has been done. The education of boys and girls. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We've got a lot of uh, expertise and knowledge in the room, so I do hope that you can stay for a drink afterwards and just connect with each other. I'm just going to ask each of our panellists very briefly to give us something to take away. We're going to go in the order we were, so uh, Lisa, would you go first? What's our takeaway from tonight, from your perspective? Mm. Um, keep talking. Keep talking about it. And if you find someone or organisations like Tear Fund, uh, like Men Engage, reach out to them, support them. There's all sorts of ways of supporting them. And online petitions as well. And I just wanted to mention Noura Hussein, who's a 19-year-old yes, yes. Sudanese yes. Um, young woman. She was forced into um, marriage. Uh, she was raped by her husband. Um, and then she fought back and killed him, and now she's been sentenced to death. So there are petitions flying around the internet, for example, with a vas, and, and um, I think there's one by Equality Now. Um, just put Noura Hussein to Google and sign sign the petition. Um, I, um, mm, yeah, thank I, it, you. Yeah. That's a really concrete thing to do. And Iman, what's your...? Yes, Noura, N-O-U-R-A. Uh, uh, Hussein, H U S E I N. Yes, change.org, Vaz, Equality yeah. Now. Change.org, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, share the knowledge of what you have and be an upstander to the injustice you see and not a bystander. Thank you. And Elaine. If you are a member of a faith group, make sure you, your theology is really good. Make sure you have a theology of equal significance of men and women together and mm. that you live that out and that everybody that you know comes into contact with that. And if you're not a member of a faith group, think about it. It's a good place to be. <laughs> so could I, on your behalf, thank Lisa and Iman and Elaine. You've addressed a very sensitive and difficult topic with strength and with articulacy and with courage. So thank you very much for your participation. Please stay and talk to them afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.